Thank you everyone for attending this fourth session of the Markets Under Critics online course. Today we have Jacob Hall. He's a postdoctoral fellow here at the Penny Initiative for the Study of Markets at the Department of Economics. And he will be talking about our markets fair in their outcomes, inequality, and other aspects of it. So thank you, Jacob. Go ahead. Great. Thanks, Fernando. Let me share my screen to share. All right. Can you see that? We good? Uh -huh. Perfect. All right. So as Fernando said, this is the fourth installment. Um, the question sort of on the table is, are market outcomes fair? So we're going to kind of kind of go in that a, a couple of ways. First, we're going to kind of think about, well, what are some market outcomes that are sort of on the table to think about? What do we mean by fair? And then sort of trying to answer the kind of the whole question throughout the presentation, like are market outcomes fair? Um, so here's a quick outline. We're going to think about income inequality, Simon Kuznets and the Kuznets curve. This is sort of some market outcomes. We're going to think about, well, what does fair mean? Here's John Rawls, Robert Nozick on distributive justice. We're going to, going to then sort of push beyond GDP and sort of the numbers-oriented approach. Think about Amartya Sen and the capability approach. And then sort of building off the capability approach, we're going to think more a little bit more about fairness I'm thinking about Adam Smith and Amartya Sen on famine. This is sort of a, a fairness in the extreme. So I like to put these like this in every slide. Um, this is like the main market outcome, in my opinion. This is world GDP from 1 AD to today. This is 2015. Um, it's basically the same in 2024. For most of human history, even prior to 1 AD, um, human beings were poor. And around 1870, in Britain and then expanding into the rest of the world, GDP exploded to what we have today. Also, absolute poverty has decreased immensely. Um, so in terms of living in poverty, on living less than $2 per day, this is 94% of the human population in 1820 was below $2 a day. In about 1995, that had fallen to 52%, sort of extreme uh, decline in absolute poverty. We go even further, those living in one on, under $1 a day, 84% in 1820. By, by 1930, it's about 55%. 1995, it's about 24%. Another extreme decline in absolute poverty. The world really is getting richer. So those are sort of the two main market outcomes. Another main market outcome that people like to think about is inequality. So this is from Pew Research Center asking Americans, what percentage are saying that there is too much, the right amount, or too little economic inequality in the country these days? 61% of Americans say that there's too much inequality. So to think about inequality, we're going to sort of backtrack a little and sort of think about some of the big thinkers who have thought about inequality and have done the human's re human work of trying to measure inequality. This is Simon Kuznets, um, was born in 1901, died unfortunately in 1985. Here he is receiving the Nobel Prize in 1971 for his empirical work in economic growth. The main thing we sort of want to focus on in his, in his research is what has come to be called as the Kuznets curve. This is a sort of famous hypothesis for those who work on inequality. Um, it's coming under a lot of fire recently, so we're going to talk about that as well. The core idea of the Kuznets curve is that as income per capita, or GDP, increases in a society, in a country, then inequality is going to face or is going to follow this inverse U shape. So when in income per capita is low, inequality will be low. And as income per capita increases over time, hopefully, then inequality will rise until at some point it begins to fall again. So there's been a lot of explanations about why this curve or why inequality might take this shape. Uh, Kuznets' main explanation is in thinking about um, modern economic growth as a shift from labor 
of labor from agriculture, which is sort of low income, low productivity, to industry, which is high income, high productivity. So we can sort of think, we start here, sort of take this world as given, and assuming the income gap between agricultural and industrial sectors, you can also think rural versus urban, remains constant throughout this transition, the sort of following logic gets us this inverse U-shaped. If 100% of the working population are employed in agriculture, right, low income, low productivity, then there'll be low, then income inequality will be relatively low. Think about everyone as sort of a human farmer. Um, so in, it, basically everyone is sort of the same, sort of getting subsistence from the land. That's a sort of story. Um, we can discuss its historical accuracy, but I think it, it, it relatively holds. As people move out of agriculture and into industry, sort of move from the urban to the rural, sorry, to the rural, from the rural to the urban, the population that earns a higher income will grow and thus inequality will increase. So we're sort of as income per capita rises, people move out of agriculture into industry, then more people will be in the high wage, high productivity jobs and inequality will rise. This development proceeds until about 50%, sort of back of the envelope calculation, of labor is still in agriculture. So beyond that point, a growing part of the population earns the higher industrial income, which at that point, inequality will begin to fall. More and more people shift into industry. Now, there's been other people who've sort of hypothesized and thought about why inequality might take this um, Take the shape. Again, I sort of mentioned models that sort of think rather than agriculture and industry, urban versus rural. Uh, Daron Asimoglu has earlier work on the political economy explanation of this. You might think as people get richer, they're going to be more democratic, more likely to kind of stir up trouble um, if inequality is high. And so the political elites are sort of forced to take actions to reform um, inequality. The question is, this is sort of cash out empirically. Does, in fact, inequality take this sort of inverse U shape? Also, one other sort of um, potential sort of policy thing that comes out of this is that this does sort of suggest that as we become richer, inequality will essentially solve itself. Inequality will decline. This is Thomas Piketty. Um, he is sort of the foremost uh, economist sort of and political um, outright speaker on these issues and inequality. This is his book, Capital in the 21st Century, a sort of famous um, 21st century book in economics. Piketty takes sort of great trouble with the story that inequality decline is inevitable as we grow richer. And so he sort of brings a sort of full might of the empirical and theoretical case against um, this Kuznets curve. So here's the United States top decile income share. So this is top 10% income share from 1917 to 1998. I sort of think of this as Piketty's sort of main um, figure, like if we're going to sort of encapsulate what Piketty is trying to say into one figure, this is it. 1917, the top decile income share in the United States is about 40%. It's sort of um, growing slightly, sort of 45% um, by 1942. In 1942, sort of around that time, there's this large drop in sort of the top decile income share. So a large drop in inequality. And then during the 1940s, 1950s, 1960s, 70s, and into the early 80s, it sort of maintains or stays at this sort of low level for right around 30, between 30 and 35 percent until sort of very recently, um, starting in the 1980s, income, the top decile income share has begun to increase. If we were going to extend out farther from 2002, which I'll show you in the next graph, it's even higher than it was in sort of the early 20th century. 
so two things to sort of take away from this um, before thinking about what does this what does this mean? How do we interpret this? Is income inequality was high in the early twentieth century. It sort of fell dramatically during the mid twentieth century, and then it's back on the rise again. We have this sort of inverse U curve. You can think of Kuznets as sort of kind of explaining this sort of dip here in 1940 and sort of hypothesizing a kind of rise that would have taken place um, prior to 1917. So this is a sort of contra Kuznets story. In fact, as we grow richer from 1917 to 2002, it doesn't really follow this inverse. Inequality does not follow this sort of inverse U curve. Right? We're richer than we were in, in 1987. Yet, income inequality is on the rise. So some interpretation of this data beyond just sort of des description. Um, this sort of preferred story by Piketty and Sayas, uh, his sort of co-author, is that World War I, the Great Depression, and World War II may explain the decline, but they don't really explain sort of why that decline persisted. Right. So there's a big decline in 42, but these are sort of big shocks. If nothing structural changed in the economy, we should expect it to sort of rise back up to sort of pre-war level. So what ex what explains this? Um, their preferred interpretation is, for the, is the creation and development of the progressive and very high top level bracket income tax for um the wealthiest, 10 and 1%. Now, there's sort of two ways to critique a story. Uh, there's sort of thinking about the theory, and there's also in sort of critiquing the data. So a lot of economists and economic historians have sort of made criticisms and improvements of the Piketty data. So here's sort of Geloso and Magnus and Let's see, Schlosser et al. in the Economic Journal in 2022, sort of, sort of hot off the presses, as it were, sort of recalculating this top decile uh, income. Now, I should say, uh, I'm not going to get into why exactly these are different. Uh, I encourage you to go read the paper. The sort of short story is contrary to what you might think, is calculating these sort of top decile income percentages is very, very difficult and requires a sort of lot of assumptions to be made. And so they kind of go in, think about what are some of the assumptions that we need, what are some, what are some that are wrong, tinkering um, with, the, with the historical record to make it accurate. They sort of come up with this proposed alternative from 1920 to 1960. Uh, two big takeaways. It's always lower than the Piketty and Sayas data. Also, the decline, the sort of famous decline in sort of income inequality or sort of top decile percentage, income percentage, begins to fall not during the war years in 1940, but much earlier um, in the 1930s. Also, uh, note, as I mentioned earlier, the sort of Piketty and Sayas data updated um, shows a very large uh, increase in income inequality from 1980 to 2010. It's even, as they say, it's higher than it was in the 1930s. There have been sort of other work um, sort of beyond the economic history angle. Alton and Splinter have, again, done the hard work going from 1960 to today. And like Geloso and Magnus, they sort of show that inequality is lower than what Piketty is saying, but also that the sort of trend line is not as exaggerated as Piketty is arguing. So what does this mean? Why, why am I showing you these? Um, this actually sort of, I think, changes this, the potential story that Piketty is trying to tell. So some reinterpretations that potentially sort of come out of this. I should note that they're not saying inequality does not exist, nor that it, there is the sort of inverse U shape, but the shape of the U and sort of the shallowness of the U is important in thinking in terms of what exactly is going on here. One, Piketty and Say sort of overstate income inequality levels in this period. 
as you can see, they sort of are always over these sort of other estimates. Two, the sort of decline during the Second World War was smaller than depicted. And perhaps the Great Depression, rather than the Second World War, played a more significant role in this decline. Again, you can just sort of see this um, just by looking at the figure. It sort of starts, the decline starts earlier in the 30s rather than a sort of this precipitous drop in around 1940. This also suggests that it's not the New Deal policy, the sort of the high progressive tax rates is not really the main driver or perhaps is not the main driver uh, behind this sort of fall in inequality. Also, uh, this increase in in income inequality after 1980 which has happened, is more moderate than Piketty has, has claimed. So just to sort of show you again, um, the decline is smaller and the sort of U is, is shallower than once we once thought, which is a great, is, is a good sign. I, it, it's, inequality has increased, but it's not as bad as, you know, maybe we had thought 20 years ago. So as an economic historian, I sort of like to take a long run approach. This is the income share of the richest 10% from 1380 to 2010. This helps us think about the sort of long run story um, that Piketty is sort of picking up on and that Kuznets is sort of theorizing about. Now, the data is not as good as it was for the US, but we have something and so we can sort of try to piece together a story. So here's income share of the richest 10%, sort of continually increasing from 1380 to sort of the 20th century. And then here's the sort of decline and then a rise again that you saw in the previous graphs. Here's the same thing. Here's the wealth share of richest 10%. Notice they track each other nicely. This is Italy, the UK, Germany, the US and France again tells a very similar story, sort of rise through the Middle Ages in the early modern period, um, and then sort of this decline, and then slight uptick again. One, you know, story, you know, we're here, as it were, in the 20th century. Income inequality, while may, if it may feel high relative to, you know, sort of the other, um, sort of the 1970s, 1960s, it's relatively low compared to 1870 or 1660. This is sort of on top of the the increased political freedoms that we, we've experienced since those that time. All right, people can vote for their elected officials. Or before, it was really these richest 10 percent that sort of decided these political elites that decided the outcome and future of the country. Here's top. Here's sort of zooming in. A little bit. Uh, here's the top 1% wealth shares in 10 countries from 1740 to 2011. This is from Scheidel. Uh, let's see, let's find the United Kingdom. So again, this sort of same story from 1740 to about 1905. There's this sort of relative rise in, in income inequality, the, the rise in the top 1% wealth share, and then this sort of decline from 1920 to 1950. You can sort of see a bit of an uptick, but sort of data is not granular enough to pick that up. So what does all this mean? Why am I sort of showing you these really long run pictures? Two key takeaways. The long run trend appears to have been oriented toward inequality growth. And two, this trend or continuous inequality growth could be inter is interrupted by only major catastrophes. So as I said earlier, relative to 1960, inequality is sort of on the rise. Relative to 1680 or 1880, inequality has declined uh, quite a lot. And that's sort of come with expansion of the sort of political freedoms in the sort of West. That's not true everywhere in the world. This second point um, is a bit sobering. 
right? This trend towards continuous inequality growth could be interrupt is only interrupted by major catastrophes. This is what I like to call Walter Scheidel's sobering thesis. This is a great book. I highly recommend it. Uh, it's Walter Scheidel. He's an ancient historian at in California. This is the great leveler, violence, and the history of inequality from the Stone Age to the 21st century. So it's this long run approach. The core idea here is that we can sort of make policy reforms all we want to sort of try to limit the growth of inequality. But the real thing in history that has lowered inequality is violence. He sort of talks about sort of the, a riff on the four horsemen. There's mass mobilization wars, violent revolutions, state and civilizational collapse, and as, as we're uncomfortably familiar, uh, pandemics. So I'm going to go back and sort of look at this long run trend. So let's look at wealth share of the richest 10 percent. The sort of large decline that we observe from sort of 1330 to about 1450, right? if you sort of know your European history, 1346 to 1353, sort of black death effectively wiped out um, half of Europe. And so income inequality or wealth share of the richest 10 percent declines. Um, so if what you want is a sort of large decline in the wealth share of the richest 10 percent, you might have to kill half of the population. That's sort of the sobering thesis here. Oh, another one before, before moving on. Um, we can sort of see it here. So another large event that we sort of have suggested is the First and Second World War that occurred. It's easier to see it here, actually. The First and Second World War from 1917 to 1945. It's the sort of large sort of decline in inequality or sort of the top 10% or 1% um, income or wealth shares. Again, it's a sobering thesis. Again, I highly recommend this book. Uh, it's worth getting. Uh, if you're interested in more, especially if you're interested in this sort of long run approach, sort of digging into how we measure um, income over time or wealth over time and income inequality over time, I recommend this hot off the press new book by Guido Alfani, As Gods Among Men, A History of the Rich in the West. Um, again, I highly recommend it. It's a good read. And it's new, so you'll, you'll be on the cutting edge. So I sort of discussed sort of the Kuznets curve, income inequality, these are sort of the outcomes. I kind of want to dig into what we mean by fair, uh, by thinking about what John Rawls, Robert Nozick have to say about justice, really particularly distributive justice. So this is John Rawls, uh, American philosopher from 19, or was alive from 1921 to 2022. He kind of has a nice um, Western, <laughs> sort of Western cowboy look to him, in my opinion. So some key takeaways from Rawls and sort of thinking about how he thinks about justice. Rawls defines justice as requiring equality, unless any departure from you know perfect equality benefits everyone in the group. Rawls focuses on patterns of sort of endowments or patterns of resources. Um, in, in thinking about equality. So he sort of looks at the sort of distribution of wealth as we, we sort of been talking about earlier and asks the question, is this whole distribution, is that just? So we're sort of thinking about distributions um, of resources or of endowments, not really so much about it, are the actions individuals are taking just. So he sets up this thought experiment and says, well, the just patterns of these endowments or of these resources is chosen behind the veil of ignorance. And so we're going to sort of get into this thought experiment a little bit. So in a sort of pre-world, sort of before um, sort of entering into the world, as it were, we can think of a social contract of between contractors for people. 
about thinking about, well, what is the society that we deem just? What society do we want to be a part of? And so behind the veil of ignorance, meaning before we enter into this world, what is the contract about what we deem a just society? What is the social contract going to look like? So Rawls argues that these contractors, you know, people, you and I, um, we're going to adopt what he calls the difference principle. Is that all inequalities are to be the greatest benefit of the least advantaged members of society. So he's not saying no inequality, um, but if inequality does exist, it's going to be to the greatest benefit of the least advantaged members of society. Now, behind this veil of ignorance, or before we go into the world, um, the contractor does not know which position he's going to be in. Is he going to be a rich man? Is he going to be a poor man? Um, is he going to be sort of what nationality or ethnic background is he going to be? And so given that, and given that he's sort of thinking about this difference principle, he's going to vote, as it were, or sort of advocate or choose for a social contract that benefits the least advantaged members of society because he may occupy the least advantaged position. So the idea that Rawls is sort of saying or pu putting forward is that the social contract that is agreed upon and what we sort of mean by distributive justice or what is a just society or just distribution is going to be one that privileges or sort of maximizes the highest index of these primary goods to sort of equal allocation. So to be, put it a little bit more concretely, you have two choices. Would you like to live in a world where everyone, say, has $100, right? Everyone is equal. Or would you like to live in a world where everyone except one person has $100, but then the other one person has $1 million. And so Rawls is saying, well, the just society is sort of behind the veil of ignorance because you don't know where you're going to be. You're going to sort of choose the sort of more equal society. So the question is, you have to ask yourself, and sort of this is a criticism of Rawls, how are you are you that risk averse? Are you maybe you're willing to play the odds to sort of be in the more unequal society? If, right, if we even slant the the thought experiment even further, would you rather be in a society where everyone has maybe a hundred dollars versus a society where one person has a hundred dollars, but maybe you have one dollar or fifty cents? Right? How, how risk averse are you? Maybe you're willing to play the uh, the chance that you're going to be that, that person. So again, Rawls is sort of focused on these sort of big patterns, um, sort of looking at the sort of, is this distribution just, yes or no? So before moving on to Nozick, um, Looking at the sort of pattern of inequality that we've shown, right, 40% of, 40%, wait, the top 10% of income earners earn 40% of total income. Is that just? Um, Rawls might say no. This is Rawls' sort of major interlocutor, sort of another famous American philosopher, Robert Nozick, who sort of lived from 1938 to 2002. Again, he kind of has a sort of uh, spaghetti Western look to him, I think. Nozick takes a different approach. Um, for Nozick, justice sort of is simply sort of laissez-faire, uh, kind of anything goes, provided that no one's rights are infringed. This quote kind of encapsulates um, sort of what Nozick is getting at. The complete principle of distributive justice would say simply that a distribution is just if everyone is entitled to the holdings they possess under the distribution. So the distribution is just if people acquire their resources or endowments through legitimate means and through um, voluntary action. 
and implicitly uh, minus the typo. He sort of felt that these theories of justice based on these patterns, right, these big um, concatenated patterns of inequality or, or of wealth are just really the wrong way of thinking about it. It's not really about the pattern. It's really about how individuals gain those endowments, right? Do they do it through legitimate ends or not? If they gain them through legitimate ends, if you sort of build your wealth through, uh, rather than stealing, through sort of voluntary means, then that's just. And that, the just in some sense, the distribution of is just. So here's... Um, sort of to, to make this point and to make it boldly, this is Nozick's Will Chamberlain argument. This is a bit of a dated argument. Um, this is Will Chamberlain, sort of famous uh, basketball star. You, maybe you can think of like LeBron or, or uh, Kobe Bryant nowadays. Uh, assume that sort of to start the thought experiment, assume the distribution of wealth is perfectly equal and thus for the sake of argument is just. Well, enter Will Chamberlain. It's a, you know, a skilled basketball player. And he's sort of shopping around and he sort of joins a team. And the condition of him joining the team is that every attending fan to all of his games will contribute 25 cents at the door in a little bucket just to watch him play. Now, being skilled, being popular, he accumulates... Uh, two hundred fifty thousand dollars this way by the end of the season. So he is twenty five, two hundred fifty thousand dollars richer, and in some sense, everyone else is twenty five cents poorer. So the the distribution has changed um, in his favor. And so Nozick asks the reader, and I ask you, is the new distribution unjust due to Chamberlain's earnings? Nozick would say no, emphatically no. Uh, Chamberlain earned his money legitimately, and fans handed over their money voluntarily. Yes, the income distribution is different now. Chamberlain is richer, and everyone else has sort of paid into that pot, but they did so legitimately and voluntarily. So the distribution is, in some sense, a new distribution that was taken on voluntarily by everyone in the group. So no, this distribution is not unjust. Notice that unlike Rawls, um, Nozick is sort of pointing out that, well, if, if people take actions to change the distribution knowingly, then Therefore, that new distribution is, is not unjust. And so that sort of brings up larger questions as well. If people are taking actions that result in income inequality, as long as they're not sort of, the people benefiting are not engaging in illegitimate actions, which they might be, um, that's sort of up for discussion, then the sort of distribution of income is perfectly just, it's fine. It's fair, even, I would say. This is a sort of another sort of another criticism of Rawls um, picking up on what Nozick is saying, but making a slightly different point. This is Israel Kersner. Uh, it's, it's a nice book. I highly recommend it. This is Discovery, Capitalism, and Distributive Justice. He's sort of picking up on what Nozick is saying and sort of re-articulating them um, in slightly different ways. The main thing that I would highlight with this book is that Rawls is sort of thinking about distribution, or sorry, production and distribution of goods as being this distinct thing, um, right? There, there's some sort of there's some pile of goods that we've produced, and that we, and then we can sort of allocate or distribute them, and these are sort of separate actions. Kersner is sort of saying those aren't really separate actions. The production of goods or the production of, of income is tied up with its distribution. And so they're not really separable. So if we're going to mess with distribution, then we need to at least be comfortable with messing with production, which is sort of what Nozick is getting at. Um, but it's a, it's a slightly different twist.
Okay. So sort of shown you a lot of outcomes. Um, and we've thought a little bit about what fairness is and justice. We can sort of push beyond these sort of measures, uh, beyond, you know, GDP, total, total income, and think about what Amartya Sen sort of called the capability approach. So here's Amartya Sen. Um, he's still alive. He was born in 1933, um, still with us. Here he is receiving his Nobel Prize in 1998. So he pioneered, along with Martha Nussbaum, sort of this idea that's sort of come to be called the capability approach. Capability approach is sort of the alternative of the sort of beyond GDP um, approach. It sort of purports that freedom is to achieve well-being as a matter of what people are able to do and be, and thus the kind of life they're effectively able to, lit, to lead. Uh, I'm not going to get into every sort of nuance of the capability approach. It's a sort of large literature that's gone beyond Sen and Nussbaum. But the kind of core um, components, at least sort of on the philosophy side of this, is that there are functionings and capabilities. So there's functionings of the there are various states of human beings and activities that a person can undertake. Uh, this is often called beings and doings. And there's capabilities, so sort of person's opportunities to achieve functionings. So these are sort of states of being, or things to strive for, or things to become. And these are well, opportunities to achieve those states. Right? right, one wealth is sort of functioning while sort of opportunities um, or access is a capability. In an effort to measure this, um, sort of economists have sort of, sort of created an index, which we've called the Human Development Index, which is sort of pushing beyond merely a total output in an economy. It's kind of an index of these sort of three things. There's that is sort of the desire or the ability to lead a, a long, that's two words, a long and healthy life as measured by life expectancy at birth, a good education, right? Expected and means and mean years of schooling, and then a decent standard, standard of living, which is measured by gross national income per capita, right? These are sort of, these are capabilities. This is more of a functioning. So here's the Human Development Index in 2021 plotted over the globe. It is, you know, it's quite correlated with what we sort of think of as GDP, but there's sort of some extra elements here. Um, let's see. Again, as an economic historian, I sort of take a long run approach so we can sort of decouple these three things and look at them over time. Unfortunately, we can't calculate the human development index over time. At least I haven't seen it. So we can sort of take these three things um, sort of independently. Here's life expectancy um, at birth and then life expectancy at age 20. The idea being that there's a lot of death in history in childbirth or sort of at birth. So if you make it to 20, this is sort of your life expectancy. So we can sort of look in England in 1550, life expectancy at birth is 38. If we sort of take account of sort of uh, death in childbirth or subsequently right after childbirth, then life expectancy sort of declines actually to 33. Uh, I want you to think, how old are you? Uh, if you're older than 33, well then in 1550, you'd been a lucky person. If you're younger than 33, 1550, you might think about your funeral soon. Notice it, it, it doesn't really get that much better as we sort of progress. Uh, England in 1550, life expectancy at age 20 is 31. Um, 1750 to 99, it's 34. If we sort of even go further back and sort of change locations, we can look at Egypt in 11 to 257 AD. It's 21. Um, I'm older than 21. 
So <laughs> I sort of would have been long gone at that point. Um, again, this is sort of this, it doesn't get better um, historically. So this is sort of, we've made huge strides, strides in this, in, on, on this account. We're also, another aspect of like a life well lived is nutrition. And we don't, it's difficult to know what people are sort of, how well their nutrition is in the first century, but a nice proxy is height. You can think on the margin, you know, if, if you're sort of malnourished and you get, get better nutrition, sort of eat better, eat more, then you're more likely to grow taller. So in the first century, sort of average was about 170 centimeters. I should say I'm about 177 centimeters. Um, so that's like 5'10". I'm not, I, you know, as, despite what I might try to tell people, I'm sort of average height uh, in the U.S. at least. And I would be way above, right? I'm not even on the scale here. So even in the 18th century, the average height is 171 centimeters. So your ancestors were much shorter than you are. And thus sort of by proxy, much worse off than you. They were sort of undernourished. So again, we've made great strides in sort of this life expectancy and nutrition element. We're also much better educated uh, than we were throughout history. Uh, I don't have the scale here, but this is sort of you know, age heaping. So you can think the question sort of on the table here is, do people know their age? And we can sort of calculate the likelihood that they're going to say a year that ends in a zero or a five. And so if, if they sort of say, oh, I was born, I'm, I'm 30, well, they, they may be rounding is sort of the assumption. So higher is less educated, lower is more educated. So over time, sort of stagnant from zero AD to about 1700, and it's fallen dramatically. Uh, again, most people today that you know, but also in sort of the, the underdeveloped world, have a sense or, or, or perhaps know exactly how old they are. Again, so before moving on, we sort of made great strides in this. And it's not just that markets have led to increases in wealth, um, right? Whatever that might mean. They've actually improved people's lives. They've We've gotten taller, we're more educated, we're better educated. Um, so quantity and quality has improved. And we're, we're better nourished and we're wealthier. So it's sort of the, the triple whammy. So I want to think about sort of further sort of contrast to large figures and sort of building off this capability approach and thinking about famine or um, to put it a little bit more sterilely, the distribution of food or the distribution of starvation in a society, right? When um, things become dire, who, who in society is sort of made worse off and why, and how do markets affect the distribution of food? So I've stolen this from uh, this sort of figure from Cormac O'Grada. Um, so I'll cite him later. I recommend him highly. We can sort of ask, well, in how do, how how do markets impact famines during a time of famine? Do they work or do they not work? And no matter what we say, do they make famines worse or do they make famines better? So Adam Smith sort of famously argued that markets work and that they make famines better. And by make famines better, I mean sort of mitigate. The problem of famine, mitigate starvation, bring food into the area to sort of quell the famine. So Smith is sort of here, and I'll quote him um, on the next slide. Amartya Sen, on the other hand, kind of takes two positions um, in, in his work. Either markets don't work, right? Information asymmetries, the sort of price mechanism is breaking down, and thus they make famines worse. Or Markets sometimes do work in, in this in, in during famine, and when they are working, they actually make famines worse. 
Um, and I'll get into why um, in a minute. Arthur Young, the famous sort of English agronomist, is that the right word? Um, sort of argued that markets don't work and thus famines are made worse. So we sort of have these three figures. We're going to kind of focus on Smith and Sen. Um, so the, sort of thinking about, well, do markets work? And when they do work, what happens? Are, are famines made worse or are they made better? So here's Smith on famine um, in the wealth of nations. So we're all nations to follow the liberal system of free exportation and free importation, right? Allowing the market to work, free trade. The different states into which a great continent were, was divided would so far resemble the different provinces of a great empire. As among the different provinces of a great empire, the freedom of the inland trade appears, both from reason and experience, not only the best palliative of a dearth, but the most effectual prevention of a famine. So would the freedom of the exportation and importation trade be among different states into which a great continent was divided. So here he's saying, not to solve a, a famine, or a sort of a, even just a, a mere dearth of food in a location, markets will sort of take over and sort of move food into that area. Elsewhere, he sort of blames, but well, when we do observe famine, it's usually because the state is sort of meddling in sort of the affairs of the market. So again, he's sort of pro-market in terms of does it make famines better or worse? So markets do work and they make famines better, right? Just think of the sort of simple, the price of food increases in the local area. There's sort of people who want to make arbitrage opportunities. They flood food into that region, allowing people to sort of eat. Here's some arts descent on the economics of famine. This is um, sort of her, her, his more famous book. Um, I highly recommend it. Poverty and Famines, an essay on entitlement and deprivation. Um, to the extent that I can tell, he sort of revolutionized economists thinking about famine um, in, in an important way that's worth grappling with. So here's a nice quote. Starvation is the characteristic of some people not having. Wait, starvation is the characteristic of some people not having enough food to eat. It is not the characteristic of their being not enough food to eat. While the latter can be the cause of the former, it is but one of the many possible causes. So he's sort of pushing people to think about famine as a distribution problem, not always a production problem. So here's a sort of um, quick outline of Sen's entitlement approach to famine. You'll notice the sort of entitlement sort of, or entitlement um, exchange entitlements maps to capabilities. Right? So they're sort of they they build on each other. So Sen is sort of articulating a sort of theory of famine or, or a model of famine that's contra the sort of pure food availability decline theory of famine sort of simple, why do famines occur? Uh, the availability of food declines, right? There's a shock to the harvest. There's less food to be had. People tighten their belts. People starve. Sen wants to shift the analytical focus on food supplies to the inability for acquiring these foods. So he has a nice sort of full model, um, which I sort of encourage you to read. But some key concepts is, well, there's a person's endowment, right? Assets and resources, right? Things they have, uh, which includes their labor, right? Things that provide the labor on the market. There's a person's exchange entitlement. Um, notice entitlement is not a normative word. Um, it's a sort of pure positive word here. Um, it's bit, That's a bit confusing. So a person's exchange entitlement is the set of all alternative commodities that she can acquire in exchange for her endowment. So you have an endowment, there's something that you can exchange for if, you know, if you're able to. And so endowments are converted into these exchange entitlements through what Sen calls exchange entitlement mappings. I think you can just think of the relative prices of goods. So 
starvation can occur if one's endowment collapses sufficiently far or through right starvation can occur if one's endowment collapses sufficiently far this is kind of the food availability decline right you just sort of lose all your endowments or kind of counterintuitively but this is a sense point through an unfavorable shift in relative prices so if you're an artisan working in a sort of a sort of subsistence uh, agricultural world. Well, if you lose your income, right? No one, there's demand for your, your shoes or, or your um, barrels declines. Well, then you're going to lose your income and that puts you at risk of starvation, right? We can think of entire groups um, as sort of potentially at risk. People who are sort of dependent on wages, are potentially at risk when there's an unfavorable shift in relative prices. So because of this, Sen is relatively skeptical of market outcomes during famines, especially ones driven by shocks to exchange entitlement mappings or ones driven by these shocks to relative prices. So this nice quote from Sen, if one doesn't have much to exchange one can't demand very much, and we might lose out in competition with others whose needs may be a good deal less acute, but whose engagements are stronger. In fact, one of the potential predictions that comes out of this is that we might even expect, expect to see food being exported away from famine-stricken regions, exasperating the, ex exasperating the problem. This is sort of, you, can, you see a lot of these complaints during the Irish potato famine in 47, that their goods are being shipped out of Ireland to the rest of the UK. So why? It's not that there isn't enough food in Ireland. We're enough food in Bengal, which is sort of the main case study for Sen. But people can't afford to purchase the food that's there. And so it's being shipped out um, for other people to consume. And so you have to ask, is that fair, right? Are market outcomes in this in, in this scenario fair? Uh, I think certainly not. Now, Sen is not the last word on famines um, and sort of the entitlement approach, um, this question of fairness. Um, there's work by Cormac O'Grada. Um, these books are excellent. I really highly recommend them. Um, he's sort of dedicated his life to studying these, these questions. Uh, this is Famine, A Short History. And the great... Uh, perfectly titled um, book, Eating People is Wrong, and other essays on famine, its past, and its future. Uh, great books. Highly recommend them. Um, Ograda is, takes a very empirical approach to studying famine, or to the extent that we can. Uh, it's difficult to get sort of data on these things. He's much more pro, or, or at least not anti-market, on these questions. So his empirical investigations, by and large, find that unless a government or a war has disrupted them, markets usually function quite well in famines. They sort of usually it's the sort of Smithian story. Now, that doesn't mean markets alleviate them really all that much. Um, they don't really seem in practice to make things worse, which is, is better than making. Is, so not helping is better than making them worse. Uh, I think the likely reason is it seems probable that the places most susceptible to famine have the least developed markets. And in my opinion, it seems wrong to blame markets when they're not really truly operating. So contra sen, um, empirically, famines have not primarily been ensued from the sort of exchange entitlement declines, divorced from supply shocks. So most famines historically, but, but perhaps not all, um, are really about these sort of supply shocks. All right, and so that sort of wraps up uh, the lecture, Are Market Outcomes Fair? So I'm gonna stop sharing now. Okay, thank you, Jacob. So we have a couple of questions. These are in order, in order of how you presented it. So are there differences in terms of inequality between countries compared to inequality within countries? Like this is for the first part of your presentation. The empirical mm -hmm. part. Yeah, that's a good question. We 
I say we we people, um, citizens, tend to focus on sort of within country inequality. But obviously, yeah, there's certainly between country inequality. Um, you can think of right, when we talk about the great divergence or sort of developed versus underdeveloped countries. That's in some sense in it, in it, a great inequality. So thinking about what are what compare like what are the measures? Are they equivalent? It's a good question. I'm not sure. But yeah, there's certainly um certainly. A second question is you talk a lot about empirical facts, but what is the theoretical argument over why markets may or may not increase inequality? Is it that some people, either by merit, a luck, or by the seat, that they get to receive more of the allocation of the resources? Mm -hmm. I think that, yeah, that's a good question. Um, there's sort of a lot of angles one could take. I do think, like one angle would be sort of more negative, would be that having access to resources is sort of tied up with perhaps your family or people you know having resources. So there's a sort of sort of snowballing effect that occurs, um, especially among the sort of top 10, top 1%. The sort of more positive um, angle would be that, yeah, if you're providing you know, goods and services through legitimate avenues and you're gaining wealth, then that will in some sense make you richer and sort of maybe exasperate inequality. But then even though those may look the same, it's hard to sort of distinguish sort of which is operating. I think inequality is probably, or sort of the, the picture of inequality, it's probably both, right? In some sense, corruption, government corruption or, or, or business corruption causes inequality, just as perhaps normal market dealings do. Uh, third question is, could you elaborate on Israel Kirchner's view? Because it follows from the fundamental welfare theorems of economics that basically the market allocation of resources may be distinct and desirable even from the original outcome produced by market interactions. Yeah, I can try. Uh, I'm not an expert on Kirchner. I've only, I, I've only sort of read that book and sort of his other things, but Kirzner, as a kind of Austrian economist, is sort of thinking about the economy as a sort of um, as a sort of market process, and so entrepreneurs sort of observe arbitrage opportunities, and he sort of coins what he calls a sort of finders keepers rule. So, an entrepreneur sees an arbitrage opportunity, in some sense, costlessly, and in the act of producing or sort of alleviating that arbitrage opportunity, he's sort of engaged in production, but then it's subsequent, like at the same moment, changing the distribution. Um, I don't know if that answers your question, but it's sort of a further elaboration of Kersner. Yeah, I, I highly encourage reading the book. Um, it's probably worth reading twice. It's sort of a, a difficult book to get your head around. One final question that is related with that. Uh, how related are distribution and competition in market interactions? Because if insiders can prevent from competition, that may also increase inequality. Yeah, no, I totally agree. I mean, that that's that's potentially, right. That's a question of what are the rules of the game that structure markets in any given location? Um, I think in economics, we tend to think of frictionless markets that sort of would push against uh, what you're saying. But if there are, are sort of, there are frictions, sort of monopolies, um, either natural or sort of sort of created by the state, and that will lead to a sort of snowballing or sort of a agglomeration of, of income or wealth that would lead to inequality. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, it's hard to sort of parse these things out, um, I think. Well, Thank you very much, Jacob. And remember, everyone, we will continue this Thursday with a talk by Cleo on these discussions throughout the history of economic thought. 
Um, thank you very much.